Welcome back to Timo's Dinky Detailing. Today I'm going to be restoring a Dinky 471 Austin van. This one is red with yellow wheels, which tells me that it's a Nestle van originally. So I'm going to be restoring it to the original condition as a Nestle van again. This model is uh, in play-worn condition. A lot of the paint has been chipped off, but it's complete. There's no serious damage to the model, so I expect I'll be able to uh, restore it fairly straightforwardly. So looking at the bottom, the base is rusty and it's dented in quite a bit. So it's been treated pretty harshly. So to start with, I'm going to remove the base. Now normally I would put this into the milling machine, but I'm doing this early in the morning and everybody's asleep. So I'm doing everything by hand, at least at the initial part of it, so I don't wake everybody up. So it only has the one rivet on the back and the front is held on uh, with this it's like the license plate uh, flap and in this case it's really bent so it won't even come off so let's get my parallel pliers out these pliers are uh, the teeth are ground off they operate parallel so they're really good doing work with sheet metal and here I bend it well, I'm not bending it, I'm just twisting the entire base until it comes out. And didn't do any damage to the casting, so I'm happy. So here's the base. I'm using my trick. This file has the one edge uh, ground off of it so that I can file right up against the wheel. And even if I'm hitting the wheel, it doesn't do anything. It's just a piece of smooth metal running along it. And I'm going to strip that paint off anyway. So this is this is how I like to take these mushrooms off. Uh, this is a machine that doesn't make a lot of noise. I could use the Dremel tool, and I've done it before. Uh, but by the time I've got the Dremel tool out of its storage and plugged in and set up, I would already have filed that off. So it's I'm happier to do that. Plus, I'm not waking anybody up early Saturday morning. So I get out my parallel pliers again and I bend as much as I can uh, but it's dented in there's no way that I can get these pliers to fix everything so I'm going to bend all the bits and pieces that I can and get those back into straight condition so it's getting there it's pretty good it's a little bit twisted and that latch that's like the front uh, license plate that's all bent up, which you would expect, a uh, play-worn toy. So now I'm going to take the tires off of the wheels. Now these ones are pretty old. They're very brittle and hard. At least, uh, at least this one was. The first one wasn't. So let's see how this one looks a little better. So that one comes off. It's still spongy. And the final one, it's completely rock hard and cracked all apart. There's no way I could have gotten those off. I could have put them in boiling water, but it, it's, it would be a vain attempt at rescuing those. I've got uh, replacement tires, so I'm gonna use those on this model anyway. And here we are, we're ready for paint stripping. So outside, got my paint stripping set up and I have my wife's kettle from the kitchen. She doesn't know about it. She's probably still asleep. And I'm going to get another. I'm going to use my son's kettle. It's in storage. So the caustic soda goes in. And you can see it bubbling. And the water's turned red a little bit more. And wait a couple minutes. And have a look. And it's pretty much stripped everything off of the model. So here back on the workbench. The wheels have been stripped as well. And so I'm brushing them up. I'm using, I bought a kit of brushes from, wire brushes from the dollar store. And it comes with a stainless steel wire brush. And my brass ones are all bent up. So I thought, okay, let's give the uh, stainless steel a try. And actually, I really like it. It's, uh, it's aggressive. It brings a nice polish. And it doesn't damage the model any more than the brass ones do. 
but the uh, brush is, is uh, more durable. So here's my hammer that I made as a toolmaker's apprentice and I'm using that to hammer the shape of the sheet metal back straight as best I can and the hammer is a very good way to do it. So the base is still rusty, so I'm going to put it into some evapo rust. This stuff is amazing. It takes off the rust, but it's not corrosive. It doesn't harm you. You can put your hands in it and everything, and they just say to rinse it off. So into the evapo rust it goes. It's a mild stuff, uh, so you kind of it takes a long time. So I usually leave it overnight. So I'm covering it up, and next day all the rust will be dissolved. So now for a little primer on the hubs. So I'm just doing the one side and then I'll have to flip those and do the other side. And on to the main casting. I'm using the Tamiya Fine Surface Primer and I believe this is gray but it's hard to see in the video. I did the wheels with the white surface primer. I finally found a supplier that uh, has the Tamiya primers in stock and I mail ordered them. So here's my uh, the body now. This is another day everybody's awake so I can go back to my milling machine so for drilling this hole. Now it's not ideal the roof of this model is all curved so you'll see that it wants to just rock down. I don't want to clamp too hard so I'm just going to put my hand on the other end to keep it from rocking so I can get that hole drilled into it. So cool tool, it's basically oil, or as my journeyman would say, it's goose grease. That's what they used to use. Uh, they used to use goose grease to, to stop the tools from sticking to the metal that you're cutting. I don't think cool tool is goose grease. So you can see what happens is that the material, the alloy material, sticks to the point. So I have to stop in the middle and I have to take my scriber and chip the, uh, the casting material off of the point of the drill. Otherwise the drill is going to overheat, it's going to get, it's going to bind in there and it's going to break off, which has happened to me several times with these models. So now I use the cool tool a lot. Last thing I want to happen is for one of these taps to break in there because then it's done. Not only that, but the top is $20. So this is a 440 uh, Osborne Blue Wizard tap. It's a machine tap, so I like to use a machine tap because I don't have to back it off every quarter or every half turn, back it off a quarter. I don't know, I don't like doing that. It pushes the swarf in front. So next day, pull the base out of the evapo rust, and there isn't a speck of rust on it anymore. These bases apparently were blued originally, so if well, when they're not rusty, they still have this weird crusty surface, and that's got to do with the bluing. Uh, the vapor rust also loosens the bluing off of the material, and so the steel is bare of bluing and from rust. And then I hit it with the brush a little bit. My bases, because of the evapo rust, they come up beautiful. I mean, this one is is pretty rough shape. It's not going to ever be perfect again, but it's going to be good. So here's my trick. I I use a, a magnet to hold my base. It's made of steel, so magnet holds it. In this case, I didn't need to put the uh, non-stick paper on there, but I did. Uh, when I'm painting this painted side, then you need the non-stick non-stick uh, baking paper. So with these hubs, of course you have to paint both sides. Some people will stick it on a wire, stick them all dis you know, separated by distance so that you can spray paint both sides in one go. I do it this way. It takes a little longer, but I'm always waiting for the paint on the body to dry. So for the body, I'm using Mr. Hobby paints, the aqueous paints. 
Uh, they, they're aqueous, meaning they're mixed with water, but they also have alcohol in there and some other solvents. So I'm putting it into an old jar that I had other red paint mixed and uh, so I don't waste a nice clean jar and then I can mix it with the thinner and I'm using the leveling thinner uh, that's the thinner that dries slowly so the paint is able to become shiny. Now I've sanded there's, a, there's some roughness on the casting so I've sanded the uh, primer using the uh, 6000 this is um, micro mesh designed for polishing plastic windows and it's used for a lot of different things but I find it's beautiful uh, it's kind of a rubberized coating on a cloth backing and I can sand these uh, surfaces very smooth and shiny and that's the only way you get a nice uh, clean coat on the thing uh, so here's another layer of primer for the body to cover up the parts that I sanded. Now I go back to the bottle that I saved the mixed paint and it goes into the airbrush. Back to my fancy spray booth. Now I'm, I'm learning to work this thing uh, airbrush. It's still new to me and there's a lot to learn so I've I'm practicing each time now on a spoon that's been primed. It's a plastic spoon and I'm learning how to adjust the airbrush so that I get a proper coating. It was still too thin. Uh, so I adjusted along the way. I realized I'm not getting enough paint coming out of it. I mean, in the end, the paint's going to come out but uh, it'd be nice to figure out how to get exactly the right setting so that I cover it in a reasonable number of coats. Of course, if I cover it with many light coats, eh, it's way easier, it just takes longer. And, but I'm more likely to get a nice clean finish without any runs. Because that's the problem. If you put too much paint on, it's going to run, and then you're done. You've got to strip the paint off and start all over again. So I'm painting the inside. Everybody paints the inside, so I figure I better paint the inside. You, in these models, there's no windows. You can see right inside, so it's better to have the paint color of the body. And you can see I'm getting a shiny coat on there now. It's got many layers of paint already, so now the primer is completely covered. And now I'm putting on enough so that it's shiny, and I'm counting on that, uh, on that leveling thinner to you know to dry very slowly and make sure that the finish is going to be shiny and in this case yeah it did turn out really shiny so now to something completely different I'm gonna polish up my axles and I find it easiest just to go to the bench grinder that has the big buffing wheel and I put some buffing compound on there and then I gotta turn it around in this uh, in this little pin vise. I use this pin vise also for screwing on the uh, cap screws when I screw the body of uh, the base onto the body. So I got to reverse it in the in the chuck and fortunately the chuck is big enough that I can put the mushroom on the inside and then polish the smooth smooth end uh, and polish both ends separately. So with the polished axle, I can attach. There's only one of the axles on this needs to be mushroomed. The other one is uh, inside the body, so it doesn't need any mushroom. Just when you when you screw it in, it's going to hold the, the wheels on between the casting. And so my technique is to use the small hammer and a whole bunch of taps. You have to do a lot of taps otherwise you're going to bend the axle so there we got it uh, you can see i'm clamping it in my specially modified vice grips for that job 
So I'm at the point now where the body is painted, the base is ready with the wheels. So now you're going to see when I put the wheels onto the base, that's a little bit of baking paper. Make sure the paint doesn't stick to the thing, even though that paint has dried for like four days. Uh, I'm, I'm not taking any chances with my paint anymore. So there's the axle. It doesn't have any mushrooms. And that's because when I put it in place, uh, the ends of the wheel, it, the wheels can't come off the axle because the axle is above the casting. It's, this vehicle has what, what's called spats that covers up the rear wheels. So the axle can't come off, the wheels can't come off. So now for detailing, I have a new tool. I've bolted a angle bracket onto the bench with a with a super magnet on it and that attaches to the to the bottom of the magnetic bottom of the steel base of the dinky toy. So it keeps it off of the base. So when I'm doing things like decals, uh, I don't have it actually resting on the bench. And that way it protects the paint because I have a big problem the paint will stick to everything. So I've also um, belt and suspenders I've got the uh, non-stick paper underneath the body as well. So there I get the uh, decal loosened and what I'm doing is I'm trying to put my pressure of the decal or decal on the paper not so much on the body because if you press too much on the body the decal will glue itself down and you can't move it anymore. So this technique is working out better for me. And now, like it's supposed to be, the, the decal slides around so I can get it into position properly before I start squeezing the water out from underneath it. Now I'm also using a drop of, of uh, dishwashing detergent in the water for the, the decal. I find if I, if I just use plain tap water, it tends to bead up on the paint. So if I use a little bit of soap, then that water uh, spreads out and covers the entire surface. So that also protects you from putting the decal onto a dry spot where it's going to stick and not want to come, not going to want to come loose and you can't move it around. So this is working out well for me. Uh, after putting the, after putting the decal and getting in place, I'm, I'm going there with the, with the uh, cotton bud and I'm squeezing out the water from underneath the decal. You can see it. It's like little bubbles, but it's not bubble. It's not an air bubble. It's a bubble of water. So you got to kind of go and find all those little bits and then carefully squeeze them out. I'm not showing all of the detail. It's, it takes a little bit longer doing it, but uh, you get the idea. After you've done this part and you've aligned it, and then you dry off the excess water, you still got to go back with the Q-tip or the cotton bud and squeeze out the little bits of water under the decal and this is working out very well for me so uh, here you can see now it's dried and I'm all I'm doing is trying to get the little bits out and you can see them under strong light and you can find them and you can squeeze them out and you can make that decal or decal perfect so now this little tool see I can move the model so that it's sticking upward and I'm going to be doing some detailing so I'm using this is the this is the non chrome silver paint I want to try and do this as original as possible so the the other type of chrome paint and in the in the marker pen is not as shiny but it's more accurate to what the dinky toy originally had on it you can see I've got a I've got a box there a shipping box and I'm using that because I can rest my hand on it so it gives me a little more stability when I'm painting these details. It's not perfect because I gotta move around to the other side but uh, it's working out okay. So now for this part I've gone to instead of the ordinary Tamiya brush I'm using the nail brush, the smaller parts uh, find this nail uh, fingernail brush is uh, it's more accurate. It's a very short bristles and I can go in there and I can get it absolutely perfectly. This one has a weird grill, the main grill and then above the main grill there's these two little bits of grill that are on the hood. Uh, so got those painted. 
And now we go to the computer. I'm going to put license plates on. I'm not doing any other detailing, but I am doing the license plates. I kind of like the cars to have a license plate. And so I, this is on my PC laptop and it's feeding in to the inkjet printer. I have a very cheap inkjet printer because uh, I'm just printing these tiny little things. And I print originally uh, in uh, low quality, black and white, and I print it onto a blank piece of paper. And then I cut a piece of the decal paper because that stuff's more expensive. So I cut it in little bits, tape it on. And when it comes through, you can see at the higher quality, it takes forever to print because it's printing at high, very high resolution, which makes for a beautiful decal. There we have it. And then I use the uh, Mr. Hobby uh, clear coating, super clear, whatever. And also I printed it on white and on clear. For the front, I used the white decal paper, but I had the, I didn't record it because I had the pause and the recording in reverse. So you don't see me putting it there. I trimmed around the decal and put it on so it had a white frame. For the back, I'm going to do the other method that I've developed, which is to use a blank white decal where I have white on the final decal. And so I've got this tiny little piece that I've cut that's going to be where the white is for the lettering on the decal. So I put that there and like anything else, I straighten it out, put it in the right position, dry it off. And then when it's, when it's dry and it's firmly there, I can put the number plate over top. Now the number plate is the one that's done clear, as you can see here. And what I do is I cut it out and then on this edge, I cut it with a knife so the paper is still longer. So I have place to control how I'm applying it. And then I wet the thing. And it doesn't take long for this tiny little thing. So I take it out of the water and let it soak for, for a minute or so. And then it's moving and I can put it on. It's a clear decal. So the edges are perfectly the way I printed them. And the, cl the clear decal material goes past them. So it goes beyond. But there's no white in the decal. But the white is from the white decal material underneath. Now this one is on a curved surface. So I'm putting the... Mr. Hobby Soft uh, to soften the decal and make it go around the curves. And I'm not sure that was necessary, but uh, I did it and it looks great. So this is the only bit of extra detailing other than the, than the license plates. Uh, this is the little illuminator and tail light for the car, which was popular in the forties on British cars. So I'm using the nail brush to get in there and uh, just do the frame. Uh, the body's red, inside that would be red. So it looks right. So here's where we started. It's a play-worn toy. It's in, it's, it's in good condition. This was a much, must have been a very loved toy by the child, but naturally it's going to get all chipped up because it's been in a box full of other dinky toys. And it's a nice model, but it's definitely in need of a bit of a restoration, at least a new paint job. So that's what I've done, and I'm matching exactly what was there originally. So let's see what it looks like now. So it's the same toy. I've decorated it much the same as it would have come from the factory, aside from the license plates. And it looks beautiful now. This is, this is what the toy would have been like when some child got it as a birthday present or a Christmas present. And in the 40s, I don't think children had a lot of toys, especially in, the, especially in Britain where they were still recovering from the war. So a toy like this would have been just amazing for any child. So it just gives you a great feeling to see this thing restored to that kind of condition that the child would have originally had it in. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Timo's Dinky Detailing. Uh, please remember to like and share 
and certainly subscribe need to get those subscriptions up this is what keeps these videos coming is when you guys watch them and share and subscribe so until next time be seeing you fuck